Hello, welcome to our first video for uh, English 201. We're going to start sort of counterintuitively at the back of our textbook where it discusses 10 different critical approaches that we could use to help us analyze a literary text. As you can see from the slide, these are on pages 878 through 904. Uh, in addition to the show that I'm making for you today with this video, in Blackboard you'll find uh, other resources on these various critical schools. You'll also find um, a similar discussion from Ole Miss uh, that covers some of the same topics that comes also, uh, that's based also on information in our textbook. So there's plenty of resources in Blackboard uh, if this video doesn't satisfy your needs. Why do we read literature? Well, there's uh, any number of different reasons for that. On the next slide, I'll discuss some of them. Most of us uh, who do read a lot tend to read for pleasure. Uh, some of us are trashy novel people. Some of us read romances or detective stories, which is what I tend to read a great deal of. Or we read thrillers. Um, we tend to read books like Harry Potter that take us uh, to some kind of a fantasy world that we want to spend some time in. Uh, but there's just as there are many different kinds of people, there's many different kinds of literature, many different kinds of tastes. Uh, in this particular course, we're going to be focusing on literature as an area of study. We're going to be looking at literature in terms of what kinds of literary texts uh, can act as sort of cultural icons for us. And we're going to be deciding what sort of criteria we need to develop to make judgments about um, what works of literature should be studied in the future, what books uh, or text are important to us as citizens in a large and complex world. Here are some of the reasons that we have traditionally studied literature. Uh, St. Augustine, writing in the 4th century AD, says that the purpose of literature is to teach and delight. This is a I think this is a 17th century portrait of what they think Augustine looked like. Uh, he actually looks Italian. Um, Augustine was African, and he wouldn't have looked anything like this particular image. We have no pictures from his life. Um, Joan Didion, who is the woman here on the right-hand side, a very famous American writer, uh, says that we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I think there's some truth to that, that we like to organize the world around us uh, narratively, that is, with a beginning and a middle and an end and characters and content and stuff. And so my sense is that the stories that we read sometimes can illuminate aspects of our own existence in ways that gets us out of the immediate life that we lead and lets us kind of look perhaps more objectively on some aspect of our existence that's hard to see. One of my favorite definitions of literature comes from the poet Ezra Pound, the 20th century American poet, uh, where he says, literature is news that stays news. And I, I think there's some truth to that. When we're reading a, a hundred or a 500 or a thousand year old text, uh, we suddenly realize that that it offers us uh, a fresh series of perspectives, not only on the time in which it's written or on the author, but also on our own lives and our own times. And I think uh, we'll talk a little bit later in the course about the kind of universal values, the kind of universal judgments and motifs and techniques uh, that we run into in both contemporary and uh, classical literature. The word critic, where we take our word critical from, is not so much critic in the sense of, of pointing out faults, which we tend to uh, see as the meaning of the term critic, but it's in fact uh, a much more complex term. It's a term that comes from the Greek word krinin, which means to separate or to make a judgment or to choose. We could read all kinds of stuff. Uh, probably a lot of you may not realize this. There's about 300,000 books published every year in the United States. And when we start looking at what's published where and, and how much fiction is published and how many short stories are published or how many plays or poems are published. They run into the thousands every year. So how do we select the 20, 30, 40, 50 stories that we might study in a semester? Well, that's part of our goal for this course is to learn how to develop criteria by which we can make these choices, by which we can exercise a certain judgment in what we're going to read, say that this is worth keeping as something that's important to us and this is maybe something that's designed strictly for entertainment. Our textbook offers 10 different approaches to this, but there are a lot more potential approaches. I'll mention three more uh, that our textbook doesn't address at the end of our talk today. 
And uh, the purpose of these is to help us fully understand, uh, fully comprehend, and indeed fully appreciate some of the works that we're going to read. Um, some of these uh, approaches are mutually exclusive and some are not. Some you can mix up uh, like what we might call gender criticism and historical criticism or psychological criticism. We can kind of lump those together sometimes um, in examining a text. Uh, others are a little bit more exclusive, uh, but for our purposes, we can sort of mix and match uh, as we go through the course. What drives our choice is the story. What exactly is the story? Who's in it? Where is it set? When was it written? Um, what's the narrative? Uh, what's it about? What's its theme, which is a word that I don't tend to use very much. Uh, and then, of course, we bring our own knowledge to bear, our own background, our own leanings, and indeed our own taste. Like, I have uh, a real taste for British detective fiction. I love police procedurals, but only if they're set in England. Okay, that's a question of taste. My wife, who reads probably more than I do, um, tends to have a little bit different set of taste. And the, the kinds of things that we read are very, very different. I should mention, we usually go through three to four books a week uh, between the two of us. These critical approaches uh, are not hierarchical in the sense that one is better than another or one is, is um, regarded as a, as a more precise way of, of examining a text, but it's the text itself and the content of that text that drives what choices we make with regard to what critical lens we're going to apply. If we do this right, we're actually going to uh, deepen our understanding and deepen our appreciation and really expand our horizons uh, through a particular work. So here's the 10 that our textbook has, and this I think is in the order in which they appear in the textbook. We start with formalist criticism, then we talk about biographical criticism, historical criticism, psychological criticism, mythological, sociological, gender, and then three newer ones, newer in the sense that these were ones that became popular in the 1980s and after. Um, the first seven are more traditional ways of looking at fiction, um, but reader response, uh, deconstruction, and cultural studies are on much more recent developments. Uh, and as a result, there's a, there's a rich body of, of discussion uh, that we could look at to decide you know, sort of what the issues are with these these last three in particular. Uh, in addition to these, I'm going to mention uh, at the end of the show today uh, three others that uh, I and others tend to lump in with this group of ten, and that is um, a Christian approach, one that has a specific religious functionality that we see in the stories, a textual one, one that looks at how something was published and when and where and what the different versions of a story might be, and then linguistic, how language itself works within the context of a text. So we'll be looking at all these uh, as we go through the rest of the slides. Okay, as the slide says, these are pretty quick and dirty definitions. These are my summaries of the summaries in the textbook. And I've shrunk these down uh, to make them as simple uh, as I can to try to grasp their essence. Um, I really have to spend some time looking at the links that I've put into Blackboard and also looking at the um, content in those pages where you'll find the discussions. Formalist criticism, or what some folks uh, like me call new criticism, new in the sense that it was invented uh, before and during and just after the Second World War, uh, is something that focuses on what we call close reading. That is, every word matters, uh, every sentence matters. Um, and we don't look so much at the biography of the writer. We don't look at the social milieu uh, around a particular story, but we look at the story itself within the context of itself. What happens? Who are the characters? What do they do? How do they act? How do they sound? Things like that. And so we tend to look at these uh, focuses in a way that helps us understand what kinds of patterns there might be, or what kinds of images, or what kind of narrative structures we might adopt, you know, where there's a clear beginning, middle, and end, or does it start kind of in the middle and then have a flashback and then go forward, which a lot of movies do? Um, does it start with the ending and then kind of carry us the rest of the way through? 
uh, formalism or new criticism is the way that I was trained when I was an undergraduate. And if there's any school that I tend to rely on the most, it's this one. And many times you'll get tired of this. Well, I'll say, where do you see this in the text? And where that comes from, comes from uh, my background uh, as a formalist critic, such as I am. The second one our textbook talks about is this idea of biographical criticism. And this is not your biography or the biography of the characters, but the biography of an author. This is perhaps the most troublesome one for students because many times students will say, hey, this guy lived in Spain. So this story that's set in Spain that he wrote must be about his time in Spain. No, that's not how it works. Um, the idea is to look at an author's life and say, well, here's somebody uh, who served in uh, in World War One, for instance, like Ernest Hemingway. Does that shape any of the themes or any of the characters uh, that show up in his stories? Uh, does it shape the language? Does it shape the structure? Um, and sometimes this can be very useful uh, to help explicate kind of what an author has in mind, especially when the meanings are, are perhaps obscure to us now. But it's not a one-for-one -one correspondence. Very few authors write stories that are autobiographical. We're going to be reading a Franz Kafka story called A Metamorphosis. And in the first sentence, the main character, Gregor, turns into a giant insect. Well, it's Kafka is a very interesting crit, uh, writer because we can use aspects of his life as a lawyer, as a patent clerk, um, to help us understand a little bit about some of the structures in his story. But we can't say, you know, Kafka must have turned into a bug one day because that didn't happen to him. Um, so you have to be very careful with biographical criticism. I mention it because it's in the textbook, but it's the one that gets more students into trouble than anything else. So use it with caution. Historical criticism, the third type that our textbook talks about, focuses on these issues that, um, as the slide says, social, cultural, intellectual milieu that produce a work. Um, you might also look at the reviews or the criticism that came out when it was written, uh, and that helps us understand a work sometimes. And so sometimes we'll look at the language or the settings or the characters um, to help us understand things uh, in a little bit more deeper way. You'll notice, for instance, when we're looking at a, at a story written a hundred years ago, that the attitudes in those stories, especially if they're written by men, uh, are very different when it comes to women than what we might see in our own time. And sometimes understanding the historical place of women, the historical roles of men, can be very useful in helping us uh, understand what's going on in a particular text. These three are the next three that our textbook talks about. Uh, psychological criticism tends to fall into one of three different forms. One where we look at the creative process itself, that is, what was the author's state of mind, if we can determine that um, when he or she was producing a particular text. We can also look at the psychology of a particular character, or we can look at the psychology of the author, him or herself. And sometimes that can be really helpful. Sometimes it's difficult because we have to know a great deal, just as we have to know a lot in biographical criticism when we consider a particular author. And most of us are not experts on a particular writer. Um, so it's difficult uh, perhaps to use this approach to look at an author's psychological state and say, ah, we can tell he was depressed here when he wrote that because we don't really know that. We just have what's in front of us. And to properly exercise that kind of critical approach, you need to know a lot about the author's life. So I tend to suggest that that's not always the most useful way to look at it. But we can certainly look at the psychological aspects of a particular character. And here, Sigmund Freud can be quite helpful. Um, the different personality types that he talks about, the different things that motivate people, uh, those can be very helpful. Freud is not considered a mainstream psychiatric thinker anymore. But when it comes to literature, the, the kinds of things that he talks about, the id, the ego, the superego, the libido, things like that, those are all the kinds of things that we might see in particular literary characters. And so that can be very useful to us uh, when we're examining a particular text, if we like that approach. The second one on this slide, the mythological approach, is actually one of my favorites. And this is one where we tend to look at what we call archetypes, that is, characters that we see over and over and over again. 
uh, a simple version of this might be the good guy and the bad guy, the hero and the villain, a boy and a girl who have a relationship uh, that turns into something else. Um, and so those are the kinds of uh, archetypes that we're familiar with. We might also be familiar with people who are good hearted or people who are misers or people who are criminals uh, or people who have an excess of pride. Uh, or people who have an excess of anger, or these are the kind of stock characters that we run into throughout literature uh, in a variety of ways. And of course, you know, a lot of these stories reflect those kinds of characters because those are the people around us. They're also the people that we tend to see, as I said, over and over and over again. And there's any number of different myths that we might be able to apply. If somebody goes on a journey uh, in a story? Are they like Odysseus in the Odyssey? Um, if somebody tries to defy the limits of human nature, are they like Icarus and Daedalus uh, from Greek myth? Uh, Daedalus being a man who assembled the wings with feathers and wax that he made for his son Icarus and himself so that they could fly. And of course, Icarus is so excited by this, he flies too close to the sun, the wax melts, and he falls into the sea and drowns. Um, so these are the peop the kinds of folks who might exhibit a certain kind of pride or a certain kind of um, attempt to overcome the limitations that all of us humans might share. And so sometimes uh, using a mythological character or a mythological approach uh, can help us analyze a particular story. Sociological uh, approach, the third one on this slide, is not that dissimilar from other ones that we've seen. Uh, before in the sense that we're bringing cultural, economic, political values and conditions of a particular time uh, at work. Um, the political side uh, is always an interesting one in stories because sometimes uh, we'll look at things and we'll see this as sort of a, an issue of capitalism or an issue of economics uh, or um, sort of a response in for or against some kind of a, a Marxist structure. Um, William Lukash, who's one of my favorite uh, sociological critics, um, long dead by the way, argues that all art is fundamentally political. And sometimes you'll see the kinds of political things, not the small things that we talk about like right now during an election season, but the larger political issues that come up in our society over who should have power and how that power should be exercised and what the limitations and capabilities of that power might be. Um, those are the kinds of things that might be useful to us when we look at an argu a, a text from a, a sociological point of view. Here's three more. Uh, the first of this is what we call gender criticism. And this is where we look at the differences between men and women. Um, <clears throat> We used to think of gender criticism as pretty much uh, feminism in one form or another. That is, women who uh, are characters in stories who have a particular function. You know, maybe they're a wife or they're a mother, and we think of those as stereotypical women occupations. But then you also meet women who are business women, or women who are wealthy, or women who are in charge of something. They're a, they're a boss. And, and those are untraditional roles. And maybe the story is about how those untraditional roles work with uh, the more traditional stereotypes and commonplaces that we have in mind. Um, these days, you'll also see some masculinist criticism. That is, uh, some aspects of storytelling where you'll see that the male characters have are, are also dealt with in stereotypical kinds of ways and may have limitations placed on them solely because of their maleness. Um, so the sexual identity of, of characters, uh, sometimes the sexual identity of the author can be helpful in these kinds of things. Uh, this is also a form of politics in the sense that most gender criticism really is concerned with issues of power. Who has it? How do they exercise it? How did they get it? And, you know, are they going to lose it or not? Uh, I tend to look at this uh, a lot, especially when there's stories where you've got relationships between men and women. There's a number of stories we'll be reading that have marriages in them. And so you look at how does the woman act? How does the woman respond to the husband and vice versa? And those tend to be stories where gender criticism can be very helpful to us in kind of teasing out the kinds of differences um, that we see between men and women. The next two here, reader response and deconstructionist, are two of the three more contemporary forms of criticism. <clears throat> With reader response criticism, um, 
there's any number of readings based on how the reader, that is you or me, uh, looks at a particular text. And so you tend to kind of, we read something and we kind of recreate what happens in that story, who's in it, uh, in our own heads. And then we respond to that story in some way. This is, to me, uh, a difficult form of criticism because it's a lot more elastic than the other kinds. Uh, and, you know, who's to say that whatever's going on in your head is better, worse, more useful, not useful than what's going on in mine when we're reading the same story. Um, but sometimes this can be helpful because certain kinds of stories will provoke certain kinds of responses in readers. Uh, I'm thinking of fantasy fiction, for instance, which I think many times uh, re people respond to in, in different kinds of ways. I am not a fantasy fan, for instance, but I know many people are. And I tend to um, discard that kind of story. I don't tend to regard it as important, uh, but others do. And I think my reader response is based on the fact that I've just never developed a taste for it. Um, but I'd have to explore if I were writing an essay about that, why I don't have a taste for it and why I find a story more or less satisfying because of that. But reader response also lets you change your mind, which is interesting. The way that we read a story when we're 12 or 13 might be very different when we're 20. Uh, a few years ago, for instance, I reread Catcher in the Rye, which I read every few years. Uh, the first time I read it when I was 13, um, it's, I thought it was the most amazing book I'd ever read. And every time I come back to it, uh, I find something I haven't seen before. I gave it to a friend of mine who's the same age about five years ago, and she had never read it before. And so she was reading it for the first time in her late 50s, early 60s. And she said, I just can't get into this. He's just a whiny teenager. And I said, I think if you'd read it when you were a whiny teenager, you'd have a very different notion of how that book works. And to me, that's the kind of benefit and drawback to reader response criticism. Certain texts hit us in certain ways at certain times in our lives and assume a certain kind of importance. Um, the opposite is true that certain texts written that's read at certain times in our lives have absolutely no effect or a negative effect. Um, and so kind of articulating why those responses might be possible is the way that you might want to think about reader response criticism should you decide to use it in a paper. Deconstructionist criticism comes from late 1960s, early 1970s French literary theorists where they say, you know, the problem with language is that there's no fixed meaning with a word. And, and there is some truth to that, that a lot of the meanings that we assign to certain vocabulary items is entirely arbitrary. Um, and also that there's no such thing as a fixed structure or a fixed narrative. Um, and so any meaning we establish is based on a variety of instabilities, which makes our critical discussion of it unstable as well. Um, but it does also tend to power in the sense that we as a critic might exert our power over a particular text in the sense that we might say, well, you know, this whole thing is kind of an unstable mess. And so I'm going to impose an order that makes sense to me on it. It's not as loose, I think, as reader response criticism, but it's one that um, does allow for an, almost an infinite variety of meaning. And it's one where you can attack the structure, the language, the content, the narrative of a story itself. Uh, as you go through. This can be very tricky. I am not a very good deconstructionist. I've done a lot of reading in it. I, I use it sometimes. I'll mention it as a something where I see a story has a certain inherent instability. And this, when we look at a story like The Old Man with Enormous Wings, for instance, where there's all kinds of improbable events, maybe that's a story where deconstructionist criticism might help us. But for more conventional stories, Mike Burke says, I struggle with it. But I am I am alone in that. A lot of my colleagues who are better at deconstructionism than I am look at things very differently. But all I will do is refer you to the readings that are posted to Blackboard and in the back of the textbook. Here's the last slide of literary types or literary approaches. Uh, cultural studies is maybe the newest. Um, and this is one that when our book was written was really hot. And in the last four or five years is beginning to lose some of its force, although there's still some cultural studies guys around. Um, 
right now, for instance, some of the big issues of the literary text is the issue of race. And some of that comes from the Michael Brown killing, some from the George Floyd killing, some from all of the other terrible things that have happened to African Americans and indeed other people of color uh, in the last four or five years. And so you're seeing all kinds of different discussions about what kind of works, what kind of approaches we should take to those works are part of the canonical structure that is the, the body of literature that we study in literature classes. Um, we have some stories in here, in fact, that have some very challenging language with regard to race. They were written in some cases quite some time ago. And so one of the issues that cultural studies lets us address is in the milieu in which these were written and in our own time, is this kind of language acceptable? The, the classic example of this, of course, and most of you know this uh, from other courses that you've taken or from other things you've read, is the use of the N-word in Huckleberry Finn. Is that use of that word enough to take a novel that has been regarded for over 100 years as one of the great touchstones of American literature? Is that enough to throw it out? It's a good question. Um, so as you can see here, Cultural studies involves a lot of different kinds of things, some of which we've talked about before. Context, um, what kind of assumptions the author might bring to bear, what kind of assumptions we might bring to bear, what kind of assumptions an, uh, an audience might bring to a story that might benefit them in some way. Um, but it is a really tough thing to define. And our textbook has a section devoted to it written by a, a man that I know who is not a fan of cultural studies. And I, it's interesting that our textbook editors picked Mark to write about this because it's he's certainly not a man who practices it. He's a formalist like I am. But take a look. And I've got some more resources on Blackboard. The last three I'll talk about real fast here is Christian. <clears throat> Most of our literature are written by people who are Christians in one form or another or have grown up in a, in a Christian society. And so many times you'll see specific religious imagery uh, in a story. Sometimes they'll go as far as making it an allegory. Um, you, I don't think we, we might have one or two stories that might fit that this semester, but you can decide. But many times you'll see references to religious dis, religious objects, religious practices. Like in one of the first stories we're reading, A Queen, Clean, Well-Lighted Place, you're going to see a version of the Our Father, the Pater Noster, the great Christian prayer that is probably a little challenging for you because it's a not exactly a parody, but it's an invocation of it in a particular context where the words are changed. Um, the second one of these that our textbook doesn't talk about is a textual criticism that is issues uh, of a story over time, whether it's changed or not changed, how it was published, where it was published, uh, how it was printed, who did the print, the typesetting, things like that. Um, this is I've taken a course in this, by the way, when I was uh, working on Shakespeare stuff when I was in graduate school. And uh, this is an area that some scholars find fascinating, and I do too, up to a point. Um, for our purposes, it's probably not something that we're going to use very often, but it can be helpful where there's a version that's published of a story in a magazine. <clears throat> and then when it's collected into a print volume, there are some small changes that might be made by an author or an editor or even a printer. And, you know, the issue there is, do those affect the meaning in some way? And the very last one is this idea of linguistic criticism. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, where we look at language itself. We look at how the words are written, what the word history is, have the words changed over time. Something that was written in 1800 might have a different meaning now because we've changed the meaning of the word, which kind of goes back to this deconstructionist idea that there's very little fixed meaning of language. Okay, so I've exhausted you with all those. What's the point of all this? Well, you got to make a choice. And the idea is to use one of these, these 10 or 13 approaches as a critical lens, as a way of looking at a story to see if we can tease more out of it than just who did what to whom and when and what happened to get beyond plot. Okay. Uh, so the first thing you got to think of is what, the, what works best for this particular story? What's the story about? What are the characters doing? What's the point of the story? What's the narrative? Uh, when was it set? Who's doing what to whom? And for some of the stories that we're going to read, uh, some of these might not be appropriate. Uh, gender criticism is frequently appropriate because most stories have both men and women in it, although I think we have a couple of stories uh, this semester that have no women at all 
And so the question is, does that modify our way of thinking about gender when there's no women? How much of our gender is fixed and uh, immutable and how much of male or female gender is developed in response to the context where you have, where you're relating with people of another gender? And I realize gender itself is a complicated concept these days because we have so many different kinds of, of human genders that we uh, that we study. Some of this, of course, is up to you. What do you bring to bear with the story? What's your background? What are your interests? What's what kind of philosophical uh, beliefs and values do you have? And so the Mike Burke approach is to pick the choice that encompasses the most of a text that is what helps you make sense of most of the story so you're not just cherry picking little pieces or little tiny incidents or little pieces of language and saying ah that's what this whole thing's about you know and that's something that i should caution you for literary criticism is not an easter egg hunt the other thing you got to do of course is remember that whatever you do you're Somebody can say, no, it's not about that at all. So you have to understand that whatever you write is going to be tentative. It's going to be uh, ambiguous. And your job as a literary critic is to make a case for your point of view. Even though um, others may challenge that point of view, you could certainly make a case. And that's where we come back to this idea of what's in the text. What's the story about? And then what's the context of that story, if that's appropriate? And so as we bring those things to bear, then it helps us understand uh, more and more about what's going on with a particular text. Okay, I've gone on a little bit longer than I wanted to. Thank you very much for paying attention. Um, please take a look at the other resources that are in Blackboard and then uh, see if this helps you understand uh, the kinds of assignments I'm asking you to do for the first two weeks where you've got uh, a discussion board where you talk about which of these critical approaches, if any, appeals to you, and then you apply a critical approach to one of the stories that I've selected for that. And those are the second and third discussion board assignments. Thank you very much.